Welcome to Alexandria, where history, mythology, and cultures come alive through audiobooks. Please subscribe, like, and comment to support us. Also, subtitles are available in over 70 languages. Just click the settings icon and choose your preferred language to fully experience the wonders of our stories. Welcome to the epic saga of Cleopatra, where history and romance intertwine to tell the tale of one of the most captivating figures ever to grace the world stage. In Chapter 1, we journey back to ancient Egypt, a land of unfathomable beauty and intrigue. Here, Cleopatra's story begins amidst the fertile lands nurtured by the Nile. Born of Greek heritage and destined to rule Egypt, her story is one of passion, power, and a relentless drive for sovereignty. As we set the stage for a narrative filled with forbidden love, political maneuverings, and the legacy of a woman who would defy an empire, join us in unraveling the layers of Cleopatra's complex existence. Her journey promises not just a glimpse into the heart of a queen, but into the very essence of what it means to be immortalized in history. Cleopatra, Chapter 1 Egypt's Elixir of Eternity, The Nile, and the Ancestry of Its Mistress the story of Cleopatra is a story of crime. It is a story about a forbidden love and its consequences. In this unusual and romantic tale, we witness this passion depicted in its entirety, capturing its irresistible desires, exhilarating happiness, reckless and chaotic journey, and the terrible regret and ultimate destruction it always leads to. Cleopatra was born in Egypt, but had Greek heritage and ancestry. Therefore, while Alexandria and the Delta of the Nile were the locations where the most important events and incidents of her history took place, it was the heritage of Macedon that shaped her. Her character and actions reflect the traits of genius, courage, originality, and impulsiveness that are inherent in her lineage. Her history, adventures, sufferings, and sins were shaped by the circumstances and influences in the warm and luxurious place where her early life took place. Egypt has always been seen as one of the most amazing countries in the world. It is a long and narrow valley full of greenery and fertility, completely cut off from the rest of the inhabited world. In fact, it is even more cut off than a real island, because deserts are more difficult to cross than seas. The existence of Egypt is truly extraordinary. If we could fly like an eagle and look down, we would see how this long and amazing valley, full of life, is formed and renewed every year, surrounded by silence, desolation, and death. It would be a site of constant admiration and pleasure. The extensive and thorough observations made for the past 2,000 years provide us with results. These results allow us to have a comprehensive understanding of the entire situation, similar to how we would see it from a high vantage point like an eagle. It has been discovered that Egypt's existence and its unique isolation in the middle of vast areas of dry and barren sand are due to some extraordinary outcomes of the overall rain patterns. Water evaporates from the sea and land and then falls back as rain in different amounts and frequencies across the earth. Rains are more common and heavier near the equator compared to temperate areas. The amount of rain decreases as we move closer to the poles. This is because the hotter climate near the equator causes water to evaporate more quickly and then it falls back down as rain. However, the amount of rain that falls from the atmosphere is not solely determined by the latitude of the region where evaporation occurs. The main factor that influences the return of water in the form of rain is the cooling of the atmospheric layer that holds it. This cooling effect can be caused by various factors, and many different causes can modify it. Sometimes the layer is cooled by moving over mountains, sometimes by mixing with cooler air currents, and sometimes by being blown by winds to a higher latitude where it is cooler. If, however, air moves from cold mountains to warm and sunny plains, 
or from higher latitudes to lower latitudes, or if it mixes with warmer air among the different currents it encounters, it can hold more water vapor. As a result, instead of releasing the water it already has, it becomes eager for more. It blows across a country as a warm and drying wind in these conditions. If the circumstances were different, it could have created foggy mists or even heavy rain showers. It is clear from these points that the frequency of showers and the amount of rainfall in different regions on Earth depend on various factors. These factors include the climate's warmth, the presence of mountains and seas, the direction of winds, and the soil's reflecting properties. These and similar factors actually create a significant difference in the amount of rainfall in different areas. In the northern part of South America, where the land is surrounded by tropical seas that saturate the hot and dry air with moisture, and where the Andes Mountains cool and condense the vapors, over 10 feet of rain falls in a year. In St. Petersburg, however, the yearly rainfall is just over one foot. The huge amount of rain that falls in South America would completely flood the country if it stayed where it fell. As it flows through the valleys and reaches the sea, the combined torrents create the largest river on Earth, the Amazon. The heat and continuous supply of moisture stimulate vegetation to grow abundantly. The result is a dense and tangled mass of trunks, stems, and vines that make it difficult for humans to enter. The vast forests become an almost impenetrable jungle, home to wild animals, dangerous reptiles, and large predatory birds. Certainly, the city of St. Petersburg, with its cold winter, weak sun, and 12 inches of rain each year, will inevitably show a noticeable difference in its plant and animal life compared to the abundant fertility of New Grenada. Nevertheless, it is not entirely the complete opposite. There are some parts of the Earth's surface that don't receive any rain. These areas are completely different from the lush vegetation and abundant life found in the Amazon. In these rainless regions, there is only silence, emptiness, and no signs of life. Plants cannot survive, and animals cannot exist. Man is always completely excluded. When there is an abundance of animal and plant life, it keeps him away from regions that are too productive due to excessive heat and moisture. On the other hand, the complete absence of them prevents him from having a home in those regions. They become large areas of dry and barren sands where no plants can grow, and rocky areas where not even a lichen can survive. The biggest and most notable region on Earth with no rain is a large area that stretches across the interior and northern part of Africa, as well as the southwestern part of Asia. The Red Sea enters this area from the south, which breaks the shape of the land but doesn't change its character. It divides the land into different parts, each with its own name. The Asian part is known as Arabia Deserta, the African area is called Sahara, and in the area near Egypt, the barren region is simply referred to as the desert. However, the entire region shares a common characteristic, the lack of plants and therefore animals, due to the absence of rainfall. The creation of tall mountains in the middle of it, causing moisture to fall from the air, could potentially turn the entire barren area into a green, fertile, and populated region, similar to any other place on Earth. As it is, there are no mountains here. The entire area is almost flat and not very high above the sea. In fact, even hundreds of miles inland, the land only rises a few hundred feet above the surface of the Mediterranean. However, in New Grenada, which is less than 100 miles from the sea, the Andes mountain range reaches elevations of 10 to 15,000 feet. The gradual increase in elevation over hundreds of miles is not easily noticeable. This is why the vast rainless regions of Africa and Asia, when observed by travelers, seem like one enormous plain that stretches a thousand miles wide and five thousand miles long. The only place where life and productivity exist is the Nile Valley. But there are actually three breaks in the continuous barrenness of this plain, 
although only one of them significantly interrupts it. These are all valleys that run from north to south, right next to each other. The most eastern valley is very deep, and water from the ocean flows into it from the south, creating a long and narrow inlet known as the Red Sea. As this inlet connects with the ocean, its water level remains consistent. However, due to insufficient evaporation, it does not generate rain or nourish its own shores. While it adds some variation to the otherwise barren landscape by providing moving waters instead of shifting sands, that is the extent of its impact. As a result, it does little to alleviate the monotonous feeling of solitude and desolation that dominates the surrounding area it has invaded. The westernmost of the three valleys we mentioned is a small depression in the land surface, marked by a line of oases. This dip is not deep enough to allow water from the Mediterranean to enter, and there's not enough rain in the valley to create a stream. Springs periodically emerge from the ground in various locations along the valley. These springs, which percolate through the sands, bring fertility to small, elongated dells. These valleys, unlike the surrounding barren areas, seem like oases of greenery and charm to travelers, reminding them of paradise. There is a line of these oases in this depression to the west, and some of them are large. The oasis of Siwa, where the famous temple of Jupiter Ammon was located, was very big and reportedly had a population of 8,000 people in ancient times. As a result, while the eastern valley was flooded and let the sea in, the western valley was just a bit lower and had less fertility because of the springs that leaked from the ground in its lowest areas. Now, let's describe the third valley, which is the central one, in Abyssinia, located to the south of the large rainless region, there are mountains known as the Mountains of the Moon. These mountains are close to the equator, and they have a special relationship with the surrounding seas and wind currents in that part of the world. Because of this, they bring down huge amounts of rain from the atmosphere, especially during certain times of the year. The falling water soaks the mountainsides and floods the valleys but a large part of it can't flow towards the south or east, where the country is mostly elevated land. The flowing water moves towards the north and continues across the desert through the large central valley. Eventually, it reaches the Mediterranean Sea, which is 2,000 miles away from where it originally came from the sky. The river created is the Nile. This refers to the water that accumulates in a region due to excessive rainfall and then flows through a rainless desert in search of the sea. If the excess of water on the Abyssinian mountains had been steady and consistent, the river, as it flowed through the desert, would not have added much fertility to the dry sands it crossed. The riverbanks would have had some vegetation, but the irrigation would only have affected the area reached by the water seeping through the sand. But the water doesn't flow evenly and consistently, during a certain time of the year, it rains constantly and in such large amounts that it almost floods the areas where it falls. Huge streams flow down the sides of the mountains. The valleys are flooded, plains become muddy, and muddy areas become lakes. This water spreads across the entire valley, creating a vast lake for a period of time. The lake spans the entire width of the desert. This lake is about five to 10 miles wide and a thousand miles long. The water is shallow and murky with a slow flow towards the north. Eventually the rain stops, but it takes several months for the water to drain and the valley to dry up. Once the water is gone, abundant and thriving plants grow all over the previously submerged ground. This vegetation, which is now completely managed and controlled by humans, must have been very unique in its original and natural state. The plant selection must have included species that can survive in soil that is submerged in water for a quarter of the year. This situation likely prevented the Nile Valley from being overgrown with forests, unlike other fertile areas. As a result, wild animals could never have lived there. There were no forests for them to hide in, and their only option for shelter during the yearly floods was the dry and barren desert. 
This incredible valley appears to have been designed and safeguarded by nature with humans specifically in mind. It feels as though nature has set it aside for us since the dawn of time, prohibiting any plants or animals that could disrupt our presence and control from entering. If one were to leave it for a thousand years and return, they would find it unchanged, ready for them to reclaim. There would be no wild animals that one needs to get rid of, and no dense forests that one needs to clear with the axe. Nature is like a gardener who takes care of the world. Nature uses different things like the sea, the sun, and mountains to do work. As a result, we get heavy rain during the summer. For these or other reasons, Egypt has been inhabited by humans since ancient times. The oldest records, dating back 3,000 years, describe Egypt as ancient, even when they were written. Tradition doesn't provide any information about the origin of the population here. These are the oldest and most long-lasting monuments ever built by humans. It is interesting to think about how the greatest human achievements are often the simplest. These achievements are most long-lasting and reliable when they involve natural processes. For instance, one such achievement happens when a thin layer of fertile soil remains on the sand after a summer rainstorm. The main part of the Nile flood is the northern part, where the valley widens and opens toward the sea, creating a triangle-shaped plain about 100 miles long on each side. The river water flows over this plain in many different streams and channels, the entire area is a large meadow with many slow-flowing streams of water. It is very fertile, abundant, and beautiful. This area is known as the Delta of the Nile. The sea near the coast is not deep, and the fertile land created by the river's deposits seems to have extended slightly beyond the coastline. However, since the land hasn't noticeably expanded in the past 1,800 years, it's uncertain whether the entire protrusion is a result of the natural shape of the coast or any changes caused by the river. The delta of the Nile is very flat and is only slightly higher than the Mediterranean. The land appears almost the same as the sea, but instead of blue water with waves, we have large areas of waving crops and small hills with towns and villages. When the ship gets near the coast, the navigator can't see all the greenery and beauty from far away. It's because the land is so low that it stays hidden below the horizon until the ship is almost at the shore. The first things the sailor sees are the tops of trees that seem to be growing out of the water, or the top of a tall stone pillar, or the top of a broken down city. The easternmost channel through which the river waters flow to the sea is called the Pelusiac Branch. This channel almost acts as the boundary for the fertile area of the delta on the east. There used to be an old city called Pelusium near its mouth. This was the first Egyptian city reached by those who arrived by land from the east, traveling along the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Because it marked the eastern border of the country, it became very important and is frequently mentioned in ancient history. The westernmost mouth of the Nile was known as the Canopic Mouth. The distance from the Canopic Mouth to Pelusium along the coast was approximately 100 miles. The coastline had, and still has, a very irregular shape, with shallow waters. There were long stretches of sandy banks that extended into the sea. In response, the sea formed countless creeks, inlets, and lagoons on the land. Along this uneven and unsure boundary, the waters of the Nile and the waves of the Mediterranean constantly fought with similar strengths. Even now, after 1,800 years since the beginning of the recorded conflict, neither side has shown any significant advantage over the other. The river carries the sands down, and the sea constantly pushes them back, making the entire shoreline very dangerous and hard for people to reach. From this description of the Nile Valley, it is clear that it was a country that was completely cut off and separated from the rest of the world in ancient times. The city was completely surrounded by deserts, making it inaccessible by land. The treacherous coastline, with its shoals, sandbars, and other hazards, 
made it difficult to approach by sea. For a long time, the city remained under the control of its own native kings. The people living there were peaceful and hardworking. The scholars of the city were well known globally for their knowledge, scientific advancements, and philosophical ideas. During ancient times, before other nations came to disturb its peaceful isolation, the pyramids were constructed and massive stone structures were carved. Enormous temples were also built, with their crumbling columns now captivating people around the world. Even during these distant eras, Egypt was known for its everlasting fertility and abundance, just as it is today. There would always be corn in Egypt, no matter where else famine might occur. The neighboring nations and tribes in Arabia, Palestine, and Syria would find their way to Egypt across the deserts on the eastern side when they were in need, thus creating a path of communication. Eventually, the Persian kings, after expanding their empire to the west up to the Mediterranean, discovered a way through Pelusium and then invaded and conquered the country. Finally, around 250 years before Cleopatra's time, Alexander the Great took over Egypt when he overthrew the Persian Empire and added it to his own territories along with other Persian provinces. At the division of Alexander's empire, Egypt became controlled by one of his generals named Ptolemy. Ptolemy claimed the kingdom for himself and passed it on to his heirs when he died. Many rulers followed him, known as the Ptolemaic dynasty, which consisted of Greek princes ruling over Egypt. Cleopatra was the daughter of the 11th ruler of this dynasty. The capital of the Ptolemies was Alexandria. Before Alexander's conquest, Egypt didn't have a seaport. There were some landing places along the coast, but no proper harbor. In fact, Egypt had very little trade with the rest of the world at that time, so it didn't really need one. Alexander's engineers, though, discovered a spot near the canopic mouth of the Nile where the water was deep and there was a safe place to anchor, thanks to an island. Alexander decided to build a city at that spot and named it after himself. He improved the harbor by digging and building walls. A tall lighthouse was built, which served as a visible point during the day and a bright guiding light at night for the ships in the Mediterranean Sea. A canal was built to connect the port with the Nile, and warehouses were built to store merchandise. In short, Alexandria quickly became a major commercial center. It served as the capital of the powerful Ptolemaic government for many centuries. Its strategic location was so well chosen that even after 20 centuries of revolution and change, it remains one of the main hubs of trade in the East. As we conclude Chapter 1, with the origins of Cleopatra's lineage, we prepare to delve into Chapter 2, exploring the early Ptolemies' efforts to meld Macedonian and Egyptian cultures. We'll uncover how Alexandria emerged as a hub of knowledge and commerce under Ptolemy's rule, the establishment of the Great Library of Alexandria, and the dynasty's descent into tyranny, marked by internal conflict and the dark shadow of incestuous marriages. Join us as we continue our journey through the rise and fall of Cleopatra's ancestors, setting the stage for her reign in a dynasty riddled with ambition and intrigue.